I now note that the hour has come. Ms. McDonald, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance, will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Councilmember Gilmore Richardson? Present. Councilmember Jones? Present. Councilmember Gaudier? Yes. Councilmember Phillips? Present. Council Vice Chair Squilla? Present. Chair Driscoll? Present. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present, and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Licenses and Inspections regarding Bill Number 240674, Bill Number 240304, and Bill Number 240471. Ms. McDonald, will you please read the title of the bill? Bill Number 240674, rescinding Bill Number 240500, and amending Title IX of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Regulation of Businesses, Trades, and Professions, by adding a new chapter creating requirements related to the operation and maintenance of electrical vehicle charging stations installed at certain commercial and residential parcels all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 240304, amending subcode A, the Philadelphia Administrative Code of Title IV of the Philadelphia Code, the Building Construction and Occupancy Code, to require proof of insurance certificates all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 240471, amending Title IV of the Philadelphia Code, the Philadelphia Building, Building Construction and Occupancy Code, by revising subcode PM, the Philadelphia Property Maintenance Code, to clarify provisions related to the necessary urgent repair program, to make technical changes, all under certain terms and conditions. The request of the bill sponsor, Bill number 240471, will be held. And then uh, the prime sponsor of 240674, uh, Council Member. Oh, Council Member. Um, I think. Did you want to make any remarks? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that this uh, bill is a result of working with the administration's Office of Legislative Affairs and the Department of Licenses and Inspection. Uh, we hope this bill will enable LNI to effectively enforce the operation and maintenance of EV chargers, and we trust their ability to develop regulations regarding electrical contractors and permits beginning on April 1st, 2025. That is one of the changes. Uh, we look forward to continuing our work with the administration to ensure that stakeholders will be properly informed on the provisions of the bill. This, this bill was one of the things that have not been addressed earlier is about maintenance, and this is really about creating a good user experience for those um, using EVs, electric vehicles, and in order for us to meet our 2050 goals of carbon emission, we really have to uh, work very effectively towards reducing uh, our carbon footprint, which means not using our gas-guzzling cars. And so I'm very excited that uh, this work has uh, established a really good working relationship with our administration uh, because there'll be more things forthcoming, and I'm um, very pleased that we are able to present this today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Ahmad. Ms. McDonald, will you please call the first panel we have to testify this morning on Bill Number 240674? Basil Miranda. Good morning, Chairman Driscoll and members of the uh, License and Inspections Committee. Uh, my name for the record is Basil Miranda, and I serve as the Commissioner of the Department of License and Inspections, Inspection Safety and Compliance Division. I'm here to present testimony on behalf of the administration and LNI for Bill Number 240674, introduced by Council Member Ahmed, and also uh, present testimony on behalf of the administration and LNI on Bill number 240304 introduced by Council Member Young. But first, uh, for the record, please permit me to introduce two colleagues of mine who are recognized 
subject matter experts in construction code and council legislation and procedures. I'm here today alongside Elizabeth Baldwin, who serves as LNI's chief code official and chief engineer. An acknowledged construction code expert, Elizabeth is no stranger to city council, having worked with council in the past on numerous bills and ordinances. Elizabeth will continue to work with the committee on this and any other legislative initiatives it may have. Also with me, there is another person who is no stranger to council, Alex Palmer, who was, a council me who, who was on council member Harry's staff. Alex is now LNI's Director of Enforcement. So I would like to take a moment to publicly thank council member Harrity for allowing LNI to benefit from Alex's considerable talents and legal expertise. Rest assured, we intend to keep Alex very busy and make good use of his experience here at LNI for the benefit of the entire city. Uh, Bill 240674 introduced by council member Ahmad well, amend Title IX of the Philadelphia Code entitled Regulation of Businesses, Trades, and Professions by adding a new chapter creating requirements related to the installation, operation, and maintenance of electrical vehicle charging stations servicing new parking areas, all under certain terms and conditions. As the committee knows, Bill 240500, which was passed last session, is being rescinded and replaced with Bill 240674. That bill now includes much needed modifications to enforcement measures, which are a critical component of the legislation. Indeed, Bill 240674 is the product of very successful collaboration between LNI and Council Member Ahmad's and her team established throughout the summer that resulted in amendments the committee is about to consider. Therefore, we would like to, to thank the council member for working with the Mayor's Office of Legislative Affairs and the Department of License and Inspections to incorporate these amendments to meet the bill's intent, enable us to more effectively enforce requirements for safe and continuous use of EV chargers. It is precisely the type of effective working relationship the Parker administration and LNI will continue to pursue with council throughout the session and beyond. Furthermore, we would note that in the interest of safe installation, bill number 240674 will require electrical contractors to, to acquire, require electrical contractors to acquire additional training in order to ensure that EV chargers throughout the city are installed and maintained in a safe and careful manner by a trained and competent professional. On the point of safe installation, we would like to note that a related initiative, a companion bill, if you will, bill number 240666, introduced by Chairman, Chairperson uh, Driscoll at our first session of council on September 5th, 2024, would provide LNI with the necessary enforcement mechanism to ensure electrical contractors possess the required training needed for working on EV charges in a proper professional manner that would always, will always keep the public safety front and center. Please note that upon enactment of Bill 240666, LNI will be able to require electrical contractors to submit a certification as proof that they have completed the specialized training needed to safely install and maintain EV chargers if they would like to do that type of work in the city. The department does not oppose Bill 240666 and will be prepared to enforce the provisions beginning April 1st, 2025, if enacted and signed into law. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present testimony on that bill and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner Miranda. I, I just would note that um, I would remind even the city that we, 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 are, we're, we have to follow the same rules. We have to get permits when it comes to, to doing city work. So I just note that for the record. And I'd like to, to uh, recognize Council Member Jones uh, for some questions. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the author of the bill to move the needle in the right direction 
uh, by way of fossil fuels and renewable energy. So thank you for that. Question, a couple of quick questions. Who will own the charging stations? Will they be the property of the city of Philadelphia? I believe it would be the property of the, uh, uh, the, the owner of the, the property would own the, those charging stations. So if a gas station or a private Excuse concern does that, they will therefore be liable for whatever happens at that charging station? I would think so, council member, yep. I mean, that's an important yes. component. Uh, with these lithium batteries, uh, sometimes they can be a little volatile. Uh, and so, for me, it would be important to know, yeah, we helped install them. We made sure that the contractors were up to a certain standard. But after that, how do we assure ongoing maintenance? Well, we, we can uh, have our inspectors on the quality of life side of the, of the department to um, go out and respond to any complaints about concerns about a particular charging station. And of course, we can collaborate with uh, those uh, inspectors on our side of L&I as uh, the um, construction division. Yeah, so some things will be complaint driven, but there should be a periodic spot inspection of these facilities to safeguard the public. And that's just me. That, public that's, a, safety. that's a good idea. That may be something to consider down the line, but right now that's not, a, not the uh, part of the legislation. And what is the optimal number conceivably of these stations? How many? I don't have that number. No, we, we don't have that number, council member. Yeah. And will they be geographically neighborhood diverse? So will I be able to charge up in North Philly? like I'm able to charge up in the Northeast, how will we determine that diversity? Um, I, I don't know if I, I wanted to just jump in here um, because when this bill was conceived, it was about making sure people had a reliable charger that would charge if they went in. What we are finding is there's a, a vast concentration of these chargers in center city, right? And part of what we are continuing to work on, as I call it, the democratization of EV. That is the theme that we are going to be working on to make sure, one, that people understand EVs are much more uh, affordable now given the uh, tax uh, incentives that the federal government is doing for even used EVs, right? And so this is now falling into the purview of people on um, you know, moderate income who can now afford EVs. What, what the issue we're finding is lack of information. So that's one, is people wanting to even consider having EVs. But the second piece is they don't have chargers in their communities, in their neighborhoods. So we are going, that is a piece uh, that we are going to continue to work on. And addressing the issue of uh, how these are inspected, uh, this is a conversation we're gonna have with LNI around, is there a 311 procedure that people who come up to a charging station and find uh, it's not working, or there's some problem with it, and uh, that gives the range anxiety that people experience, which is why they don't adopt uh, the use of EVs. That's another piece we're going to be working on. Uh, to your point, if there's a regular month, you know, every six months or once a year inspection, that window when they come might be fine, right? But these things happen uh, in real time. There's no way to know whether the uh, the credit card uh, uh, part of the machine is not working or the actual uh, charger is not working. So we need to have a system in place for people to report that, in addition to a potentially having a yearly inspection to make sure everything's uh, on par. So these are things, now that we have established a good working relationship with LNI, we hope to uh, further this, but I am very interested in the democratization of EV across Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that because sometimes we have to build a plane while we're attempting to fly it. But we also 
need to be thinking about down the line uh -huh. what things we can start to plan for in the present. Yeah. Uh, rest assured, uh, a council member, uh, we'll continue to work with the council person as well as the committee uh, to address these issues and hash out what can be done and how to better enforce and have better maintain these charging units. So I like your term, member, democ Yes, democratization. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> A long I like word, that. but conveys exactly what we want is if we want to reach our 2030 goals of zero carbon emission, that is a very tall order. And if we don't have a strategic way of getting there, and so not only we want to work with LNI, we're actually working with the planning department currently on another bill. And uh, we hope to continue to work with them to actually see how the parking authority is going to be involved in you know, uh, spaces uh, outside of just these commercial spots to see how we really make this something uh, that Philadelphia can be known in the in the country as a leader. So whatever mapping. I can make just one point. That's a very very important point. That the fire department needs to be looped in and taken their concerns taken into consideration on anything going forward. But that's a real good point. Excuse so, me. So as you build this, please keep us, the chairman, informed as to mapping, as mm -hmm. to where they're being installed. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Jones. Uh, hearing no further questions from the members, uh, this panel, uh, and there are no other panels to testify, uh, we will call witnesses on bill number 240304. Ms. McDonald, will you please call the first panel we have to testify? But Basil Miranda. But before we do that, I, I think I want to recognize Councilmember Jeffrey J. Young, uh, the author of the bill, uh, for some opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, good morning uh, to members of the committee and good morning to uh, those who are here to testify on this bill. Um, I introduced this bill because in the 5th District and, and beyond in our city, um, there has been a proliferation of building collapses uh, due to uh, neighboring construction. And um, in uh, the city that we have, which is uh, the, you know, everyone we, we says it's just the largest, poorest big city in the country, right? And so because of that, we have a very high rate of low-income homeowners, uh, many in gentrifying and developing uh, neighborhoods, who go through uh, this uh, experience of development uh, feeling like they don't have any help, there is no um, help for them uh, as developers continue to develop their communities um, and, and what they say, right, destroy um, their communities. Oftentimes, um, you know, people don't know where to go. They don't have the, the, the funds to hire engineers. Uh, they don't have the funds, um, you know, to hire their own contractors to come out there to do assessments. Um, and so there's nowhere for them to run, right? When I was in private practice, um, I got plenty of calls from individuals stating they are looking for representation because of what a developer has done to their property. Um, and unfortunately, um, in private practice, uh, that, that litigation costs money. And there, there is no public programs, there are no public programs that provide this type of funding when a property has been damaged by a private developer, right? They all say it's, it's a private issue. You call LNI, oh, that's a private issue, right? LNI goes out there to inspect the safetyness of it, but who makes that person whole? Where is the justice for that person who's spent their entire lives, a, a lot of times, in this property, um, and now uh, their property is deemed imminently dangerous, it collapses, and they have nowhere to go, nowhere to turn, right? And so the premise of this bill is to allow those homeowners, those property owners who have been damaged by those developers to go direct to seek their justice, right, directly from uh, those developers' insurance companies so they can put their claim in um, early on without having that without having to initiate a lawsuit in court that is very, very expensive. Um, so this gives them a first step to, to seek that justice to be made whole again um, when it comes to their properties. Uh, the Inquirer reported that about 50 properties 
collapse a year because of neighboring construction in Philadelphia. This is something that was reported in the inquiry of last year. Um, and, and they also found that black residents are five times more likely to live next to a construction site where the city has identified unsafe practices. So that's just where the, that's just the ones that, have, that go reported or where there has been a complaint. So imagine the, 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 the others that are out there um, that have not been reported, again, because those property owners just do not know where to turn. Um, and so when, as a city council, it is our job to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of our communities. And I believe that this bill uh, moves us in a step in that direction to protect our property owners uh, from developers um, who have um, unsafe uh, practices. And so, um, you know, that's the premise of this bill. That's what we're trying to get to. Um, I do know that uh, the department uh, has um, concerns about certain language. They agree with the premise of the idea, uh, but we want to work out um, some technicalities of the legislation. Um, but I want Philadelphians to know, those in the 5th District specifically, to know um, that this bill is to protect you, it is to protect your assets, um, and it's to protect your generational wealth, um, and it's to ensure that you get justice uh, when you are wronged by developers. So thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for allowing me to speak, um, and I look forward to working with the department to make this bill better for our city. Thank you, Council Member. I'd also like to recognize uh, Count, uh, Majority Leader Gilmore Richardson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to our colleague, Councilmember Young. I, I wanted to rise this morning to thank you uh, for your sponsorship of this legislation. I think it's exceedingly important uh, relative to what we know we are dealing with in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, even at our first session of council, uh, when we returned uh, two weeks ago, we had residents come in uh, from uh, Council Member Gaudier's district talking about all the challenges that they are facing uh, with uh, developers and a certain developer in their particular community and how uh, it has made uh, not only uh, their lives Lives, uh, but their uh, livelihood a challenge uh, each and every day and so I wanted to, to thank you for the legislation and you know ask that you all continue to work together uh, regarding the uh, proposed amendments that have been offered that I did have an opportunity to read uh, and also the amendments that have been offered uh, from Councilmember Young. Uh, I know that there is an opportunity uh, for us to uh, meet in the middle and ensure that um, we are still meeting the goal of the council members legislation um, while ensuring that from an operational perspective um, you all are able to uh, ensure that you are meeting the goals of council member young's legislation um, so thank you all very much and thank you colleague for this important legislation it's needed uh, across the city of philadelphia and we appreciate your work on this thank you leader and i'd like to rec recognize council member phillips I just want to take 30 seconds to say thank you, Councilman Young, for putting this together. This is an incredible piece of legislation. I did read in the Enquirer and was deeply saddened by individuals who live next to properties that are being constructed and then they have to deal with their property potentially being damaged and then have to take out their own insurance. Um, this is certainly a problem in the city of Philadelphia. I know sometimes we think about the cost and dollars of things, how, you know, who's responsible, but the way I see it is that if it's a problem, we got to figure out how to f fix it, right? Especially when it's thousands of dollars worth of its work. And so it's our obligation to make people's lives easier, especially in a really working class city. So. Thank you, Councilman John Young. And I also would like to recognize Councilmember Squilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Basil, maybe you could ask, answer the question on insurance, because now we always hear that when this stuff does happen, there is insurance required for the permitting part, right? Up to a million dollars. That is correct. Why is it that when they do damage an adjoining property that oftentimes it says, well, your property's not covered, only the property that is doing the work. Candidly, lawyers, lawyers, lawyers. Uh, I mean, they'll just try to obfuscate, try to divert um, uh, issues away from the, the reality of what, what actually happened and uh, force people into retaining an attorney and litigating and you know, going to court rather than having, having it resolved and settled. 
amenably. And most of our residents don't have the wherewithal to do that, right? So what happens is they end up being not made whole. Um, legislation like this would guarantee sort of that that insurance would cover the adjoining properties. Mm -hmm. And if, that, if it says that, if it's mandated by L&I in order to get permits, wouldn't that then stop these lawyers, lawyers, lawyers from yeah. getting involved? Right. Well, we look at the legislation as supplementing what is already on the, in the code. And also, at the same time, this would send a clear signal out to everyone and, and a, a clear notice that this type of activity won't be tolerated by the city any longer and that the, the average homeowner will have uh, some sort of uh, understanding on how to proceed. And that would make everybody, in my opinion, a lot more accountable. Because the worst possible thing to hear from us and from L and I, whether, well, this is a private matter, it's a civil matter, right. it's between yeah. the two property right. owners, right? And you hear that often enough, and you feel horrible because now they have to hire an attorney, they got to go after the person doing it. Sometimes it's just an accident, sometimes it's just bad contractors, right? But either way, we have to be able to make that adjoining property owner whole, or at least put protections in place so that we can. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's a great piece of legislation that has been needed for quite some time. We, we put in the adjoining property uh, owner's bill for demolition, right? We have that now, notification and letting people know, but this even goes another step further that allows, if there is an accident, if there is a problem, that they will be covered by the insurance of the people doing the work, or, mm -hmm. or at least it's on the permit or the contractor has to have that. Mm -hmm. And then, therefore, we as a city are now making sure we put those protections in place. So um, thank you for what you're doing. Looking forward to hopefully being able to get this um, in, in a place that could benefit, you know, I think it actually helps the contractors too. Yes. It, it, it protects them, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem is some of our contractors, they go from one LLC to another. And, uh, you know, one LLC, you sue them, you go to court, they go out of business, they start another one. Yeah. Um, and that's something else we have to work on. That's a future. concern too, yeah. As yes. well as the so-called fly-by-nights that are not code compliant, not properly licensed, not paying their, uh, meeting their tax obligations. That we, we at L&I want to focus on that group of actors out there also, so. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Scroll. I'd like to recognize the uh, leader, uh, Gilmore Richardson. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and to that point, uh, my colleague's point relative to ensuring that there's an opportunity uh, to hold uh, these individuals accountable. I know you haven't gotten to your full testimony yet, but I wanted to mention specifically page two of your testimony, number two. If you could speak to uh, number two, and I'll read it here for the record. Um, we are concerned that even though LNI can readily incorporate the contractor's acknowledgement of an agreement with the property owner into the permit application and provide notice to the adjacent property owner, the bill's requirement that the applicant, contractor, or developer provide LNI with copies of insurance certificates naming abutting property owners and LNI's subsequent review of the certificates will cause service delays, primarily due to changing or outdated ownership records that may not accurately identify the current legal owner of the adjacent property. Could you speak to just the, the first, I'd say first and middle portion of that statement? Because I know that you all have some additional information relative to ensuring that um, the OPA records properly identify um, ownership. Uh, but if you could just speak to the part around um, providing LNI with copies of insurance certificates naming abutting property owners, because I think that gets to uh, sort of the, the meat of the issue and protecting uh, the abutting, adjoining, or adjacent property owner. Our, our basic concern about that aspect, uh, council uh, member, is that we would be forced, LNI would be forced to tracking down the the legitimate, accurate owner of the property. And that would in turn uh, delay any issuances of permits and other things of that nature. So that's our concern. Okay, that and I, I, I appreciate that concern, but I do think that is the role of OPA. And so mm -hmm. if 
the OPA and Department of Records process is working as I know both of them have stated is working and we've worked very closely with uh, Commissioner Leonard and also working with OPA to ensure that even when ownership changes in a property, that that information um, is reflected on the OPA website. It's supposed to be within three months, if I'm not mistaken. And so um, understanding that information and that that's outside of the scope of your department's work, I'm back to the original question relative to uh, ensuring that as a part of your department's uh, issuance process, why you would not be able to receive the insurance certificate as a part of what you would need to do on your end with the contractor? Oh, I, I think we would be able to receive the insurance certificate. That, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Our concern is that to make sure that proper notice was given to the legitimate proper owner of the property would hold up our processing of, of uh, permits. Okay, well then I just ask as a part of this process, if, if we could just get from the city's Office of Property Assessment and the Department of Records the timeline mm -hmm. now that it takes to ensure the ownership uh, records are accurate. And I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. There were times in previous years where one would purchase a property and uh, the accurate ownership information would not be reflected on the OPA website for quite some time. Mm -hmm. That has changed, I'm being told. And so if we could just get an accurate uh, mm -hmm. timeline regarding how long it takes, mm -hmm. and then that would be the trigger for your department to then say, if you know this is December yeah. and the property was just purchased or own, a home ownership or ownership change Changed. occurred in October, I'm right. using that as an example, maybe we will just triple check with OPA and records that it's up to date. But outside of this time frame, we know that the ownership should be correct. Sure. Okay? Yep. That's All right. Thank a good you idea. We could follow up on that. Yep. Great. Sure. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure, later. Uh, I'd like to recognize the maker of the bill, Council Member Young. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll hold and wait until um, the um, witnesses put their testimony on the record and then I'll come back. Well, with that, uh, Commissioner, when you state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. Sure. Um, Chairperson Driscoll, uh, members of the committee, uh, Bill 240304 introduced by Council Member Young will amend sub code A of the Philadelphia Administrative Code of Title IV of the Philadelphia Code building instruction and occupancy code to require proof of certain insurance certificates all under certain terms and conditions. As the committee knows, this bill will require any and all construction and demolition contractors and developers on every one of their projects to name the abutting property owners as an additional insured on a general liability policy with a minimum amount of $500,000. It would supplement Another provision in the code that requires a contractor to provide a verified certificate of insurance with minimum general liability amounts of $500,000 to $2 million covering property damage before L&I can issue any permits associated with the project. Rest assured, the Parker administration and L&I are dedicated to ensuring safe and lawful construction in every neighborhood as part of the mayor's effort to make Philadelphia a safer, cleaner, greener city with access to economic opportunity for all. Therefore, LNI fully supports the bill's intent to protect adjacent property from reckless, negligent, non-code compliant construction activity. We would respectfully request the opportunity before this committee to discuss a few operational concerns we have that make effective enforcement of the bill a bit cumbersome and problematic. On that point, the administration is happy, happy to continue working with council to address some of those concerns. Perhaps with further amendments, we can ensure that the legislation's intended goal will be achieved. To highlight a few of the department's operational concerns, if I can proceed. First, we would recommend that the scope of work triggered triggering the insurance requirement and definition of the effective properties in the bill be clarified to mirror 
the protection of property provisions in section 3307 of the Philadelphia Building Code. This would provide continuity and consistency with enforcement. Section 3307 identifies work that may directly impact a neighboring structure, including excavation within 10 feet of an existing building, construction or demolition that impacts a party wall, modification of any shared structural component, and so on and so forth. Thus, this would subject this type of construction activity to increase notification and monitoring requirements. Number two, we are concerned that even though LNI can readily incorporate the contractor's acknowledgement of an agreement with the property owner into the permit application and provide notice to the adjacent property owner, the bill's requirement that the applicant, contractor, or developer provide LNI with copies of insurance certificates naming the abutting property owners and LNI's subsequent review of the certificates will cause some service delays as I laid out to uh, Council Member uh, Richardson's uh, concerns. Number three, we would also recommend that the bill mirror 3307 and utilize the city's Office of Property Assessment Records to identify ownership with additional provisions relating to recent property sales, as the council uh, member uh, mentioned, and deed filings. Also, it's worth noting that, we sh that this legislation should allow and permit a condominium association to be named as the insured in lieu of each individual owner. That's something we can work out. Finally, we need to point out that emergency demolitions initiated by the city may be impeded by the bill's requirement. So we would recommend an exemption in the bill for demolitions performed under contract with LNI and in compliance with the current procurement department specifications. It would be the same type of exemption that is already present in section 3307. Accordingly, we respectfully request that this legis legislation be held in this committee to permit us to work with Council Member Young on amendments that we would allow, that would allow us to uh, work through some of our concerns and prepare, prepare for proper enforcement. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony to, to uh, uh, the department is more than well, willing, uh, ready, able and willing to work with the council and the council member on follow-up uh, concerns. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, before I recognize the maker of the bill, are there any questions from the committee members? Councilmember Phillips? It, it, so it's noted here that you are concerned that even though LNI can incorporate the contractor's acknowledgement of an agreement with the property owner into the permit application and provide notice to the adjacent property owner the bill's requirement that the applicant, contractor, or developer provide LNI with copies of insurance certificates naming the property owners and LNI's subsequent review of certificates will cause service delays. So ultimately, you're saying that this bill has these amendments because by requesting for a cop, this insurance upgrade, so basically the idea is just so the folks who are listening understand, if you are, if you're a property owner and there's a building being built next to yours that could potentially impact your property is now this bill says that that property that's about to be built needs to have insurance that's going to cover your building, your house, your property in case something happens. So there's, you're saying that there's going to be a delay, and I just want to get a better understanding of like what is what is the delay, uh, and yeah. how do you one of our, how do you make sure that the delay doesn't like what are the things you can do to make sure the delay doesn't happen? Councilmember, one of our concerns yeah. is that we would be obligated to make sure that the certificate of insurance that was submitted by the contractor is legitimate and not uh, a fabrication, for example. I mean, our audits and investigation unit uh, has uh, carried out a lot of these types of investigations. 
And it takes a little bit of time to you know, track down whether or not that certificate that was submitted uh, is legitimate. So that, that's our concern. So, okay, I got, so, so, so I, and I, and I wanna go back to what was said earlier, because you did say that, I love this part, that the, um, the team up there, which I think is great, or fully supports the bill's intent, which I think is amazing. And so I'm thinking the idea is, you know, maybe one of the things that could, if you wanted to have any amendment that could be helpful, is that in the event that it is a fraudulent, fraudulent assurance mm -hmm. copy, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they can get some level of like an extreme fine to the point where they could be held liable mm -hmm. legally for presenting a fraudulent copy of an assurance to the point where they, they, they may not even want to ever do that again, mm -hmm. right, to present something fraudulent. So I think yeah. that could potentially be helpful yeah. if that's a concern. But, you know, I just, I just saw the problem, but I was saying, did we think, you know, did you were you able to take time to think through, you yeah. know, that, that issue? That was what I, yeah. the question that I had. Like, how, how much time have we put into thinking through how to make it work yeah. as opposed to presenting the problem? Yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's a good point, and I'm yeah. sure we can get together with the council members, staff, and our staff. There's a lot of smart people there, and we can come up with a creative uh, okay. solution. Yes. All right, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Member Phelps. Uh, Member Young? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question was along the same lines. Uh, essentially, wouldn't that be an incentive to the contractor then to provide you with legitimate insurance if they know there's gonna be delays on their end, because I'm be, be quite honest with you, I'm not concerned about a project coming, a project being delayed. Mm -hmm. My concern is the property owners next door, right? right. That's, that's my concern. So I think we need to, I guess, have some mechanisms, mechanisms in place to ensure that their contractor is going to abide by the law. And so if they're not, if a delay, time is money for them, right? And so we want, I don't think as a legitimate contractor, I'm going to do anything that's going to delay my contract permit review period. I want to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, and so I think that is an incentive for them to make sure that they are providing a legitimate um, insurance certificate to license and inspection uh, to make sure their review period is as quick as possible, particularly if they're filing for an expedited permit and things like that because they don't want any delays as well. Um, so I, I, I would kind of you know, disagree with that, 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 that premise, that, um, that, that point there. Um, our, again, the idea of it is to hold those bad actors, those developers accountable to, to the community. Um, second question that I had re regarding your um, emergency uh, demolition um, exemption that you are requesting. Um, now, in, and I think that it's important that we have those, um, uh, we have that program um, because properties that are identified as imminently dangerous uh, pose an imminent threat to our community. But what um, assurances are there or what can we provide to those property owners that are dealing with that instance as well? Good morning, members of council. My name is Elizabeth Baldwin. So those demolitions would be constructed to our own specifications, our procurement specifications, and our, those demolition contractors are fully vetted. As far as how claims are currently handled, we'd have to look into that and get back to you. Right. And, and so just being someone who, is, who has practice in, in this particular area, representing clients against folks who have, uh, against representing clients who have issues with the city's program, right, where demolition has occurred and has damaged their property, you have to go through, file a claim of risk management. Then you have to go through all of these steps and extra steps, and it's just long, in, it's just long periods of time where folks get frustrated. And so that is what I'm trying to do, is trying to compact that time period to allow someone to be made whole. Um, and so I, I understand why the city would want to have that emergency demolition exemption, um, but I still think that they have to get insurance anyway for, in order to be a part of the demolition program. So what time frame, right, how long does it take for them to amend their insurance certificates to then add that, that neighboring property? Because you can quickly identify who the neighboring properties are when it's a demolition, quickly. You identify the parties that will be potentially impacted. So what hold up, like what other hold up would there be um, regarding, or? 
adding them to the, um, without having that emergency demo exemption. So may I ask a question? Do you need permission in order to name somebody on an insurance certificate or can you just name somebody? So I think you, you, you need to have the property owner's um, permission, I guess, to include them on that, right? But if the law allows us to make, if the law mandates that, the, the, that supersedes that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what we would have to discuss with your office to figure out what the legal requirements are to add somebody on because for an emergency demolition, frequently the adjacent owner is absent. So that would be a significant challenge for one, but I think we need to fully vet this and um, better understand the legalities in naming somebody on an insurance certificate and figure out the best path forward. Yeah, that's something that I think we can quickly come to a resolution on again, because if we mandate that, if the law mandates that they have to get named, they have to get named, right? Regardless of what the insurance industry requirements are, mm -hmm. right? They have, their requirements have to abide by what our law say. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Member Young. Um, hearing no further questions from the, the panel here, or from the members, uh, Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. And thank you, Ms. Baldwin, for your testimony. And uh, clearly we still have some work to do here, but I think we're all in agreement that, that uh, we're headed in the right direction. So thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair, if I may, one more point, Mr. Chair, just to add clarification. So there are other jurisdictions in the country that have this similar mandate, New York City being one of them. Um, so if your uh, staff can take a look at what New York City does, I think that we could come to a resolution quickly on that. Sure. That's a good idea. Good. Ms. McDonald, would you please call the next panel? Dr. Janet K. Thompson. And this is continued testimony on bill number 240304. Good morning. Good morning. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes. My name is Dr. Janet K. Thompson, and I live at 3911 Pins Grove Street, and I've called this my home for more than 20 years. Um, I just want to go off record real quick. I feel like the poster child of this bill that I just heard about, but it's something that really struck home. So I first lived um, in the house that I'm currently living in now, which I became the owner. I was a house sitter at the time when I moved into the home. My husband lived in an efficiency apartment at the time, and I told him there was no way I would be leaving a three-bedroom house to move into an efficiency apartment. So he reluctantly and lovingly moved into the house I had been house sitting for our current home on Pensgrove Street. We were friends with the owners and they told us that we were, when they were ready to sell the property, we would get first opportunity to purchase the property. In the fall of 2021, we purchased 3911 Pensgrove Street. My purpose for this introduction statement is to convey the frustration and picture of how as a house sitter, I became a homeowner and my excitement and dream <clears throat> quickly turned into a nightmare due to the unfair, unchecked, uninstituted, and unconcerned uh, ungoverned laws or lack thereof which construction companies and their uncaring concern of offering homeowners renters protection and or coverage through their insurance company in the event of damages caused by their workers during the process of their job that they were hard to do. So this brief personal story is why I feel passionate about bill number 240304. It was one month to date, 12-11-21, we experienced the following incidents after they finally owned our forever home. My husband noticed that there was water bubbling up in the street. It looked like it was coming from our property so he had a plumber come out and check it. 
Thankfully, the plumber told my husband that it wasn't our pipes. It was the next door neighbor's pipes that were broken. My husband notified the tenants that lived in the property next door about the problem, and they passed the information on to the owner who, wasn't, who doesn't live there but rents the house out. The owner came out to his property at 3913 Pence Grove Street and realized it was, in fact, his pipes that were bubbling water in the street. On 12 16 21 that morning, I got up, went to my bathroom, I turned the water on, no water. I go downstairs and look outside my front door to see people working on the streets where the water had been bubbling out. It appeared that the owner of 3913 Pence Grove Street hired some guys to fix the pipes, so I asked them how long was it going to be before um, I would have water. Um, they didn't respond right away. There was a delayed response to me after I asked the question. After approximately 30 seconds or more, one of the workers finally told me it would be about two hours. It was about 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon when I approached them with this question. I then noticed that there were no city signs out as usual when the City of Philadelphia Water Department comes out to do work on the streets. Later that night, around 6 or 7 p.m., someone knocked on my door. I think it was um, a supervisor, allegedly, who told me, we're done fixing the pipes at 3913, but yours are now gushing out water. I was confused because nothing was wrong with my pipes before these people began digging in the street. He then told me, he, we can fix it for you uh, for this amount of money, which was $1,500. Then he brought the price down to 700. I told him no. No, no. I know my pipes weren't broken before. He asked if I had gotten a defective violation notice from LNI for my pipes, and clearly I hadn't. So he told me, oh, you'll get that tomorrow. So 12 17, 2021, indeed, someone came on this day and left a violation notice the next day on my front porch. As a homeowner and renter, I felt that we were being penalized by these construction companies when our properties are damaged by their negligence, but the owner is under pressure to finally take on the responsibility for repairing the damage through our own insurance company or out-of-pocket payment. As I mentioned above, in the fall of 2021, we finally made settlement on my property at 3911 Pensacola Street. What was supposed to be, again, a momentous occasion turned into a continual nightmare to date. We talked to the alleged supervisor, Plummer, of the owner next door about this situation of my water being turned off without prior notification, how long our water was going to be off because of their negligence with damage done to our pipes. They, the owner and plumber, alleged supervisor, were cordial at first. The plumber's supervisor said to me that he would hook up my water lines to 3913 water line so um, I could have water by way of the water hose from the owner's property to our property. But then the owner told me he can't do that because it would be illegal. But his alleged supervisor told me that he'd speak with the owner about the water hose offer. The owner finally moved forward in agreement, but stated that he wouldn't have to charge me insult to injury, for the excess usage of water for his bill for the month. As this nightmare was happening and is still an active issue because the owner of 3913 has yet to repair his pavement where the hole was dug to repair his pipes. I had a mini meltdown to the point that I was on 
and still am on anxiety medication, having to bargain with this owner at 3913 for something that was clearly his responsibility to fix. In March 2022, we were still dealing with COVID. I ended up catching COVID during this time. I also was later informed that my mother had Alzheimer's and dementia. As a result, I was back and forth taking care of my mother amid this water pipe issue that had really pushed me over the edge. I got so fed up, one of my daughters had to be the one to talk to to the owner, I'm sorry. At that point, I had to take care of myself and my mental health. So I called the water department. They told me about the help loan. I didn't want to borrow money that I wasn't expecting to borrow. We're seniors living on a fixed income. We didn't have spare money like that, but I needed water. So I accepted the loan and the water department came out and fixed my pipes and my sidewalk almost right away. Through it all, I was so stressed that I didn't even think that I could sue for damages. By the time I was told it was, res it was the responsibility, it was a possibility when Council Member Gautier referred me to community legal services. Again, the sidewalk in front of their house at 3913 is still broken to this day. It never got fixed. And I need to add that I even started receiving violations for his broken property and I had to straighten that out. So this has just been insult to injury the whole time. So every day that I look out of the window or walk outside, I see this reminder of what it is and what could have been. The process of having to talk to the owner next door, having him lie to me, and then having him go back on his promise was exhausting. Working on the street where the water had been bubbling out. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It took, I'm sorry, it took all of my mental fortitude to this, and all I have to show for it is an additional $56.33 per month incurred from the help loan in addition to my regular water bill as well as my other bills. It may not sound like a lot, but on a fixed income it is. I know passage bill number 240304 may, may not benefit me now, but I want to see this law come into fruition for those that may be impacted the same way I was. I wouldn't have to go through all of this if I could simply have been put onto this contract insurance and then file the claim on my own. It would have saved me a lot of time, anguish, and money. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doctor. And I'm sorry for that experience that you and your family had to go through. That's horrible. I think it highlights why Member Young is 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 trying to come to the rescue here. And uh, you know, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to share that with us because it was very important testimony. Uh, do we have any questions from the members? Hearing none, uh, Ms. McDonough, could you call the next panel? Vincent Fang. Good morning, Chair Driscoll and members of the Committee on License and Inspections. My name is Vincent Fang, and I am an attorney with Community Legal Services Row House Protection Project, and I, I am a proud member of Council District 2. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Bill Number 240304. CLS is a nonprofit legal aid office that provides free legal representation to low income Philadelphians on a variety of civil legal matters, including home ownership issues. As many members of this committee are aware, Philadelphia's historic stock of row houses is being damaged and lost at an alarming rate due to careless adjacent construction. In turn, the intergenerational wealth and equity that many black and brown families have built in their neighborhoods is being erased. Last year, this council, with the steadfast advocacy of Councilmember Squilla and Councilmember Jones, funded CLS to hire an attorney to represent Philadelphians whose homes are or are about to be damaged by adjacent construction. 
This funding allowed CLS to respond to the urgent needs of low-income Philadelphians who would not be able to afford private attorneys in, this civil matters, in these civil matters. The Row House Protection Project is able to educate our clients of their rights regarding adjacent construction, negotiate with builders for access and repairs, and if necessary, litigate in court to make our clients, their families, and their homes whole. Systematically, we hope to promote a culture of compliance and accountability when construction is necessary. Thank you for your continued support. Bill number 240304, requiring permit applicants to include adjacent properties onto their insurance policy is a big step to achieving that culture of a compliance. When negotiating access agreements on behalf of our clients, we regularly require builders or contractors to include our clients on their general liability insurance policy, and we have received little pushback on, that, on this request. However, this homeowner by homeowner approach leaves far too many Philadelphians to fend for themselves. This requires the homeowner, such as Dr. Thompson, to muster up the courage to talk to a builder, let them know that the builder's work damaged their home, and then ask them to fix it. I have represented clients who were then told to file their own insurance, file on their own insurance policies. Of course, the natural fear is an increase in insurance premiums for damage that was not caused by the homeowner. Even when the homeowner then files a report, the insurance policy would point them to the builder's insurance policy, and around we go, with homeowners having to live in dangerous situations while they await funds to fix the damage. Right now, the onus is on the person whose home is damaged. Each, each interaction with the builder or insurance company serves as another barrier. Bill number 240304 takes a proactive, balanced approach to this issue. By including the adjacent neighbor onto the builder's insurance policy, the neighbor can file a claim directly with the insurance company if their home is damaged. The insurance company, of course, will still send out an investigator and ensure that the claim is legitimate. As the policyholder, the builder will also receive notice. Furthermore, we believe that this proactive approach will ensure that builders are more careful with their work and serves as a disincentive for disreputable contractors to take shortcuts. First, I want to thank Councilmember Young for introducing this bill. While there is more work to be done to ensure Philadelphians are able to continue living in the neighborhoods that they helped build, this bill is a big step forward in creating a proactive approach to ensure accountability and compliance. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Fang. Uh, are there any questions from members? Thank you. Here are no further questions. Uh, and there be no other panels to testify, we will now transition to our public comment session. Ms. McDonald, will you please call the first person making public comment we have to testify this morning on the bill before this committee today? Josh Harris. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Council and uh, the Council for L and I for allowing me to speak today. Um, but, uh, Again, please state your name for the record. Oh, my apologies. My name is Josh Harris. Um, I'm not the owner of the Sixers, um, <laughs> but uh, I am involved in construction in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I was a general contractor for about 15 years, so I know uh, L and I quite well. How uh, how the system works. Um, I've also been asked to help in situations where adjacent property has been damaged, um, and I really appreciate this bill, Councilman Young, for, for bringing it to council. Um, one question, I mean, I think one of the challenges here in the elephant in the room is the insurance company themselves. Uh, this, this allows for a direct claim to be done, but I think a lot of the challenges insurance companies often deny based on the intimate details of their policies. Um, my understanding is with adjacent construction, specifically excavation and underpinning, they look for a specific instance where the foundation was eroded. And if there wasn't a direct impact or a specific moment in time where they can say this, that's when it all proceeds to court then. Like the insurance companies consistently deny. So in a far greater picture, it's the policies of insurance companies that are also deeply affected by the outcomes of these claims. 
um, because I don't believe a, a certificate of insurance is a binding document. And um, I guess one question I have is, w does anyone know the total number of general contractors licensed in the city of Philadelphia? I don't. I don't know if, does that one I have? Yes, for, for general contractors, about 2,500. 2,500? 2, yeah, I found it concerning, of, I've never heard the idea of uh, checking the legitimacy of a certificate of insurance. I mean, every time we apply as a general contractor to the city of Philadelphia, we're asked to name the city of Philadelphia as additionally insured. Uh, what I understand as a general contractor is there's different levels. You know, you could be for excavation, carpentry, you can't build above five stories. But those certificate of insurance don't know the details of your specific policy. And I know a lot of excavators might not maintain insurance for underpinning, which is the real challenge of all the buildings that have excavated, uh, that have caused um, adjacent property damage. Um, I think the other challenge is to become a general contractor in the city of Philadelphia, there is no test. Mechanical engineer, uh, mechanical contractors like electricians, plumbers, and HVAC, maybe HVAC has changed, have to take a master test to be licensed. To be a general contractor in the city of Philadelphia, it's a tax clearance in OSHA 30, the city of Philadelphia application, and a certificate of insurance policy. And insurance companies don't vet you. So for about $2,000, you could be the excavator uh, of an adjacent property. And I think oftentimes that leads to developers creating construction companies specifically for their project. Like you guys say, fly by night, and then they disappear on the next one. And I know other cities and states, especially those prone to hurricanes and earthquakes, have very strict rules for general contractors to be licensed in the city of Philadelphia. And while I don't want to take away other people's business, there could be stages of types of general contractors, handyman person that can do windows, doors, kitchen and bath. But when you're excavating and building five-story buildings, I, you know, or, or more, um, I think there has to be a little more scrutiny and, and weed out the field. Um, I think a couple other... Uh, I'm not here to discuss the systems processes necessarily of LNI, but um, you know they have a third party inspector doing the special inspections. I think a lot of the challenges we're seeing are mainly excavations. There are other issues of water damage that happen towards the end of a construction project, but oftentimes these special inspectors, which are third parties, that they're not regi the, which, which absolves the LNI inspector of the excavation inspection. Uh, and it, during the main process, they come at a certain point, but not throughout. There's no real time um, uploading of these documents. And as a contractor, you're often pulling teeth to get these documents from the, LNI, the special inspectors. And it's usually at the end of the project. So you could be at the end of a project and all of a sudden you realize no one did the special inspection. So it seems like in order to go into the next stage of framing, all of these special inspections should be cleared and uploaded and clarified because oftentimes there are rogue contractors who just miss this or just don't do it, you know, and somehow things get cleared and you have a building that's five stories up and they have to get x-rays. So I think um, it'd be great to have sort of a, a public hearing on some of the system processes of LNI and how that can be improved. Um, and, uh, I think it's a great start, and like everyone said, there's a lot still to be done. Um, I wasn't prepared for this, so I, I saw it uh, last, last night, but I, I think it's, insurance companies are definitely, you know, some of the biggest challenges with all of this, because I think what you also don't understand is, or, I'm sorry, what's, for, for those, some residents who own their house outright don't even maintain property insurance, potentially. And so that adds another level. So wherever there's ways to, um, you have specific l and inspectors who are trained in excavation and underpinning versus the district inspector that might have been a plumber for 30 years and now is an l inspector who might not have the same keen eye to excavations. Um, there, there are ways to look at this because you know I, I, I deal with a lot of city inspectors and they all have their specialties, but when it comes to excavation, uh, it's a very specific, uh, you know, way of excavating when it's underpinned. There's various rules, and as you know, that it, it, it can lead to some very serious disasters. So um, I think that's all I have to say, and I apologize if I wasn't as prepared as I'd like to be. 
Well, thank you for taking time. Uh, the important comments you put on the public record today, and they'll be duly noted. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Mr. McDonough, please call the next panel. Mr. Chair, I do have one I'm question. I'm sorry, uh, recognizing <laughs> Member Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thank you for your testimony today. I think that helped uh, provide a lot of insight on what we can be doing as a city uh, to do better, not only on this particular issue, but others. So I have my, I'm taking notes, my staff and I will be working on some of those things uh, that you mentioned. Um, well, re regarding the insurance companies themselves, and we know that there's a process that, you know, th they're, they're not trying to their goal is not to give out money, right? That's not their goal. And so when it comes to uh, actually filing a claim with the insurance companies and then there's a, a fact-finding um, uh, time period. Now, in, in your case, when you've been working with some of those property owners um, trying to uh, fix damage, um, what has that time frame been between the insurance company uh, coming out to do their assessment and then ultimately actually making a payout if they do make a payout? Um, with the specific example of, an, of a, a foundation damage, mm -hmm. uh, I was involved, it was a friend of mine for the one on the 2700 block of Poplar. That, In the 5th Council District. <laughs> that took almost two and a half years to get a legal settlement. Mm -hmm. And wow. it's still sitting there as an open hole. Wow. And the, the people moved out and had to buy new property. Um, in, in other instances, the owners often fund the bill, if they can, to get the work moving and, and get whole again and hopefully seek legal recourse afterwards. Because typically, there's also areas in insurance where like negligence isn't always covered. Like if you just did something that was negligent, they might deny it. It's, it's one thing if you drop a hammer on a, on a countertop and that you replace the counter, but like if, if you didn't have your, your, if you were working outside of your insurance requirements, like excavators often do who don't have underpinning, I think they have the grounds to deny your claim. So then it goes to legal suits. Um, so yeah, it's not like, as everyone knows, it's, it's loops, even unfortunately with the Office of Risk Management as well. You know, it's, and you have a 60 day time period apparently, uh, sometimes with risk management. So it's, it's challenging, you know, especially even someone with, the know how to navigate L and I and insurance companies, uh, and as much as I try to avoid lawyers dealing with lawyers, it's it's a slow process and it costs money. And just to answer that quick question about getting certificate of insurance that was floating, it takes it's if you have a this was earlier in the in the it's the same day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I want to get an insurance certificate naming the person next door, I usually get it by the end of the day. So it wouldn't add any time. And currently, LNI already has, as part of your process, if you're doing new construction with excavation, you have to get the signature of the adjacent person in order to get your permit. And if you don't, they delay the permit 60 days. So they already have that. I think that's already a policy. Mm -hmm. So like getting another insurance certificate, especially if it's law and you don't have the person consent, you could just ask for it in the application for the new building permit, just like they do for naming the city of Philadelphia. Name three more people and you're done. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. McDonald, would you call the next uh, witness? Rebecca Brett. Have a comment? Elena Br Brunner. Good morning. Good Please morning. state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Uh, my name is Elena Amelgen Bruner. I am from the Brewery Town Sharswood Neighborhood Coalition. We are a resident led community group. Uh, we also work predominantly with the Brewery Town Sharswood Community Civic Association and the Lower North CDC. Um, we conducted a very brief survey of local residents uh, last night into this morning, and we received 13 responses. Um, all of which are long-term residents, people who have lived in their homes for decades, um, have, lived, have raised their children there and their grandchildren there, and the majority of them are now retired with fixed income. Um, the majority of the responses are coming from the west side of Corley Street. It is the last uh, residential block of 
long-term homes, I guess is the best way to describe that, um, between Master and Jefferson before new development um, closer to the park. Um, the majority of those homes are seeing structural damage from development that had occurred up to five years ago. Um, most of them are cracks within foundations, cement cracks in the flooring, um, which is now prone to water damage and mold. Um, and then we also see uh, damage to their, their backyard cement, which is also leading to foundational issues uh, with water damage. Um, and then, hold on, getting to my notes. Um, one person did mention that their, um, their porch structure that's holding up the second floor is leaning towards their house. Uh, so it's compromising the integrity of the foundation to the second floor. Um, again, the majority of these people are on fixed income. They are mostly retired and going through litigation to try to get those fixed, uh, going through the insurance claims, going through all of that time and energy um, is not possible for them. Uh, so it is affecting generational wealth. Um, it's affecting their personal health on a physical level. Um, and also their just mental health of having to live with damage that they did not um, cause to their own house, but is caused by other people. So that's what I got. Yes. Well, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the members? Yes, one question. Member Young? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, one quick question on your, now this was just a, a, a quick survey of your membership like, done last night, correct? Yes. And, and how many folks responded to this, uh, the survey? It's just with this quick turnaround. Quick turnaround. Uh, we only got 13 responses in total. So, and we had one just come in while I was sitting here. So just for the record, Mr. Chair, I just want to say, just in one night, they were able to identify 13 property owners who have experienced this issue in one neighborhood in one night. And so we were able to really, really vet this. Uh, imagine how many property owners would come forward to say that they have been experiencing uh, this particular issue citywide. So I just want to commend you for coming here today, um, you know, to put that on a record. But just to note that this is a, a citywide issue that affects more folks than that actually go report it. So thank you again for, for coming today. I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, in addition to that, this is only for Brewerytown Sharswood Neighborhood Coalition. It's one of the three enter entities in that area. Brewerytown Sharswood Civic Association is also conducting their own survey, as well as the Lower North CDC, uh, Ms. Darnetta up there uh, responded to my email this morning because she didn't see it yesterday. Um, and she also has a list of people who have previously um, came to her with damage concerns. Thank you. I'd like to thank all our witnesses for joining us today. There be no further questions from the members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify on bill number 240674 and bill number 240304. I will ask if there are anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have failed to call and that wishes to offer testimony on, on the bill being considered today. Hearing none, I want to thank the panels and the witnesses for their participation today. We value your opinions. This concludes the public hearing of the committee. We will now go into a public meeting to consider the action to be taken on the bill, bills before this committee today. We will now convene the public meeting. As a reminder, bill number 240471 is being held at the request of the sponsor. Ms. McDonald, will you please call the roll to take attendance. Members that are in attendance, please indicate you're present when your name is called. Councilmember Gilmore Richardson, Councilmember Jones, present. Councilmember Gaudier, Councilmember Phillips, present. Vice Chair Squilla, present. Chair Driscoll. Present. The Chair recognizes Councilmember Squilla for a motion on the amendment to Bill Number 240674. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer an amendment to Bill Number 240674. A copy of that amendment is circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to Bill Number 240674 be approved. Second. The Chair notes for the record that Council Member Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to Bill Number 240674 be approved. 
All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries, and the amendment to bill number 240674 has been approved. The chair recognizes Council Member Squilla for a motion on bill number 240674 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 240674 as amended to be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as submit the first reading of this bill at our next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Council Member Jones seconds a motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 240674 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of this council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. The chair recognizes council member Scola for a motion on an amendment to bill number 240304. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 240304. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee, and I move that that amendment to bill number 240304 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Council Member Jones seconds that motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 240304 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. And the amendment to bill number 240304 has been approved. So uh, before we vote, uh, just once again, uh, Council Member Young, uh, this is very important. A lot of work has gone into this. Uh, I've heard from L and I. Um, I've heard, I heard from our majority leader. It, we still have some work to do on this, uh, but I'm going to uh, move that it, it comes out of committee today with the understanding that you're going to continue the dialogue so we have a more perfect bill before it's finally passed. Without, Without an, uh, suspension of, of the rules. So uh, I'd like to recognize Council Member Squilla for a motion on the bill, number 240304. As amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 240304 as amended, be reported from this committee without a suspension of the rules. Second. The chair notes that, for the record, Council Member Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded. The bill number 240304 as an amended be reported from this committee with a favorable without, recommendation. Without, without a favorable recommendation. Oh, no, with, no, a, with favorable. a favorable recommendation. Uh, and with a no rule uh, suspension. And all those in favor signified. signified by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. This concludes the business before this committee today of licenses inspections. Thank you all very much for your attendance. Sorry, sorry about that. That's right. Yeah.